Life is not a storybook, and sometimes bad things happen, and sometimes bad things happen to kids. My name is Karen Martin, and I'd like to tell you the story of what happened to my son, Eddie. On December 7th, 2006, Eddie was a junior in high school, a scholar athlete playing varsity football, hockey, and baseball, an honor roll student, and a member of the National Honor Society. He had a large group of good friends and a close family. On his way to hockey practice, Eddie was sitting on the back of a car and he fell off. My husband and I got a call, and all we knew was that Eddie had been med-flighted to the hospital. When his dad and I finally made it to the emergency room, we were told that Eddie had a soft spot in his leg, a chipped vertebrae in his back, a fractured skull, and if that wasn't bad enough, he was suffering from a traumatic brain injury. We didn't understand what that meant then. We were brought in to see him, and a breathing tube had been inserted and he had been sedated for the helicopter ride. The ER staff took him out of his sedation and he began thrashing about. And we thought, this is good, right? He's moving. We tried to talk to him, but he couldn't focus on us. He didn't recognize us. He had no idea who his mother and father were. It was only then that we began to understand. Eddie's brain was swelling, his brain was bleeding, and was forming clots, which prevented his brain from draining or working the blood through his system. We were told that they were going to have to insert a bolt in his head to measure the pressure and allow drainage. We had to sign a release to perform the procedure and I remember thinking as I signed it, I'm turning over a big part of my heart and soul to these people I had never met. I'm hoping it's the right thing to do. Eddie was put into a medically induced coma and brought up to the Pediatric Intensive Care Unit or PICU. And before this happened, I had a hard time knowing the difference between Tylenol and Advil. And now we were talking about pentobarb and Profofil and Agachabandin and intracranial pressure. We were counting seconds and minutes, which turned into hours and days and then weeks. And each day, the PICU team had to manage a new risk and could only address the most critical issue at hand. Eddie's blood pressure was too high, his heart rate's too low. The swelling in his brain continued and eventually there wasn't going to be any more room in his head. He started to develop clots in his legs and arms and if the clots traveled to his heart, it would stop. And each day we watched the PICU team manage each risk, making split second decisions while trying to keep us calm. And eventually they had to put a screen in his leg to catch the clots. He was too fragile to move to an operating room, so the surgery was done in the PICU at his bedside. His kidneys started to fail and he had trouble maintaining a stable heart rate and blood pressure. His brain was still swelling and bleeding and it was hard to believe he was so sick. He only had a small scratch under his eye. After six days, he had in fact run out of room in his skull and his brain was still swelling. And this type of injury has a 97% fatality rate and Eddie's only chance at being part of the 3% and beating the odds was to have a bilateral craniectomy. They were going to remove two large pieces of his skull and put them in his stomach to allow his brain to swell. And if he made it through, we'd put those pieces back later. And as Eddie was being prepared for surgery and the doctors and nurses had answered all of our questions, a nurse was holding me as they wheeled him away. And his dad and I were talking to Eddie who was still in his coma, hoping he could hear us comforting him when a tear came from his eye and then the PICU staff held us as we cried. And he made it through the surgery, but we were cautioned not to celebrate. He still had a long way to go. In fact, he coded four times the next day, and each time the PICU team pulled together, they stayed calm, they focused, and they managed the crisis. And all this time, and over the next weeks, we were told that it was still uncertain what his quality of life would be like if he made it, but the PICU never gave up, so neither did we. On Christmas Eve, Eddie's doctors told us they would be removing the breathing tube and begin taking him out of his coma. They prepared us for what might happen, and they coached us through it, and eventually Eddie opened his eyes. He didn't know what had happened to him, but he looked right at his dad and me, and he knew who we were as he looked into our eyes. And as the PICU staff continued to help Eddie through the next several issues, we always felt we were the most important thing they had to deal with. 
And in sitting with other families whose children were sick as well, it was clear they felt the same way. They gave it their all, all the time, to everybody. And during the holidays, another family came into the PICU. Their daughter was Eddie's age and had been in an accident as well. And although we didn't speak the same language, one night when there was an interpreter there, as we waited to enter the PICU, I told them to stay positive, to keep their faith, and believe. Because behind those doors, they perform miracles. And they do. Eddie is a living testament to the lives they save and the work they do. Our story has a happy ending, thanks to them.